There we go. So good morning, everyone. Ron Legero. I'm with uh, CDK Global, uh, Handle US and Canada for their consulting arm. And I think uh, uh, actually the best experience uh, that I have for this actual call is, uh, like Rick mentioned, my, my retail experience in the past. So I've had a lot of different uh, uh, positions in a dealership and was a used car director at a couple big places where I'm from, western suburbs of Chicago, a big market. Then I became, uh, uh, was a partner with somebody in an infinity store, learned a lot about uh, used. So a couple of things that I want to talk about, I hope that everybody can see the screen here, uh, is kind of thinking about your strategy. So take a step back for a second, only going to spend maybe six, seven minutes here. But first you have to take a step back and, and get your sales flowing again before you even think about the, the uh, uh, used car strategy. And, and what does that mean? Yeah, of course, there's differences and things have changed and we're all, look at us on the call, right? We're <clears throat> embracing this new technology and it's working. Uh, but you, you have to keep the sales going. You have to look at some of the workflows and things you have going. So I'm starting more at a high level of, of thinking about workflows before I, I funnel this down or drill down to just use cars, right? Because this can happen anywhere. You, you, you influence uh, the deal, align the products and services and things you have, but in order to maximize your, your revenue, your profitability, you have to have a plan. But in the meantime, you also have to realize that things have changed a little. And especially in the beginning, you don't know what you're gonna see. Is there gonna be that pent up demand? Probably yes. Uh, People have bought, at least in the areas and the cities I've looked at and the dealers I've talked to, uh, have had um, really nice kind of increase over the last month uh, in used cars. Whereas I think it was 38 or 42% new cars being down uh, in May, used cars were up 6% if you take uh, North America and look at it as a whole. That's, that's interesting. But you have to understand and engage the customers know what that process is gonna be. If you have an online process, make sure that everybody in the dealership understands it. The worst thing is, is trying to get a second chance at a first impression, right? So uh, think about this first before we dive in and, and look at some of the things you can do uh, in your used car department. And some of this you look at when, when I, when I uh, move the slide along and you think, okay, yeah, I know this, I do this, but one big thing, and you're gonna see I use this on, on one of the later slides, I'm really big on process versus recommended behavior. Two totally different things. I've trained myself and our sales team to ask good questions instead of selling so that they understand who, you know, who they're talking to. And a lot of times when I ask a dealer, hey, do you have a process in, let's say, the service lane? Uh, are your advisors uh, calling, let's say, um, unsold follow-up, right, the client services? And they say yes. Okay, and then the next question usually is, okay, tell me what it looks like. Does it happen every day? Well, no, it happens when they're not busy. That's great, it's great intention, but that's not process, that's recommended behavior. So as we go into what it looks like in uh, the new environment, I've been reading a lot and I've heard this term and I heard it again la this last week and I, and I see it online, melting ice cubes, right? That's what used cars are. And that's how you have to think of them. So they're great in the beginning. And I was thinking about it even this morning before uh, I got on the call. Like I like to have a glass of bourbon every once in a while. I like that big cube, you know, the big round cube. And yeah. it's great in the beginning, but if you leave it sit there for a while, it waters down your drink. And you have to think that same way with the used cars, that whole melting ice cube idea, right? So with people getting back in and getting engaged, a couple of things that you have to know first, right? Used cars depreciate, we know it. 17% each year, they say on average. So regardless if they're online or in store, have that process first, know what it looks like, make sure that your salespeople, whoever answers the phone, whoever's making the appointments, everybody knows what it is, but at the same time, start looking at the processes that get you there and start looking at the inventory. Uh, people that were, were stuck with a lot of inventory uh, two and a half, three months ago, all of a sudden they're making you know larger profits than they ever have been because why? Because cars at the auction, right? Everybody all of a sudden goes in, you get these lease returns, et cetera. And now all of a sudden dealers that had inventory are starting to see a surplus as if they made this grand decision, right? This 
smart decision. So take those things in, in and put them in your pocket, but know that there's other things that go on at the same uh, time. Like you see here, the second bullet point, Cox Automotive, a competitor of ours, new vehicle sales, they say we're down uh, 28% the last week of May. Uh, used vehicles, like I mentioned, up 6%. So I've seen that same number or report two times in the past uh, seven to 10 days. I saw and I put this in here, and I think it's important because you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You always look at what your competitors are doing, especially the industry leaders, right? You see the Carvanas and the people that are doing their thing and they're spending all this money on advertising. And I'm thinking, I don't know if you guys have seen it, but reading a couple articles over the past two weeks where Carvana lost, you know, X amount of millions of dollars and their stock went up huge. Well, how does that work? You know, I want to, I want to learn how that works, but it's because even though maybe they weren't selling in the beginning, their inventory is, is, is in line. They also have a nice process, especially on streamlining their recon, which we'll talk about in a second. Uh, but they CarMax, when you look, they brought back a ton of employees, two thirds that tells you, right. That tells you where the, where the spark is. And then here's the one key in Canada and U S it's different. But when you combine them, it, it's really kind of similar. It's a big number in the U.S. I saw that in Canada, it's 30 to 40,000 off-lease vehicles a month will be coming back in. And then you have this man-made piece where you're going to have a lot of the, um, uh, of the uh, companies that have these off-leases trying to put them back into the market periodically. So you don't know how they're going to control it or alter it. So you have to be ready and know that used car prices can come down. Right now, they are going to remain high, it looks like, through, through midsummer. So 340000 uh, total a month when you take in U.S. Uh, and Canada together. A lot of stuff on these last two. This is all I have, uh, two slides. But I put this up here, not to go through and read everything to you, but take a look at these and pick what you like. But you have to look at reconditioning. This is where I really learned to become a, used, uh, a good uh, director. And I had a dealership in Chicago that had like seven lines, a huge, huge dealership. And we had everything. Uh, and you'd go to the sale and you'd buy all these cars and you'd look at recon and you'd, you'd see how long the cars were sitting in line. You'd look at these metrics. These are things that everybody on this call knows because you're all successful. But you have to look on, even when you're taking on these cars, what are the, the gaps in the inventory right now could, could actually put you in a position to make some bad decisions uh, going forward. So watch out for that. So you see the first part here. You know, I take in a car. I know that instead of having 35 used cars that I have on the lot or 100 or whatever it is, I have 50% of that number, right? So I make some bad decisions maybe just so I could get some more cars in the pipeline. Bad idea because you have to look at it and know that some of those cars, guys, aren't even going to make it to the market, right? You run them down the lane. You have your used car recon guy look at it, and then you find out you have all this stuff. Don't make don't be caught in a position where you'll, you'll put yourself uh, uh, kind of in that way to make that bad decision because you're trying to make up inventory and get people in your you know, dealership excited, see new cars on a lot, et cetera. So have an exit plan. It says it's yes, it's no with trade-ins. I, I agree, yes, right? So you don't have an exit plan for each car. It might sound like a lot and it might be overwhelming. An exit plan for each car, yeah. When you appraise it, what I used to do is on that actual appraisal sheet and it's digital, it's not digital, whatever it is, I would have the used car manager when I owned the store put in a sentence or two on what their exit plan for that car was. That doesn't mean that it's going to be perfect right then and there while they're appraising the car. But guys, it shows what their thinking process is and it helps you even in your manager's meetings so that you guys know how you're all working together. Because the last thing you want, and I see it in a lot of stores, is that silo. The new car guy has to make a deal. They don't care what the used car manager says or they'll bump it. If everybody's working together and they see what the thought process is from the used car manager, I think that's key. And I, I think some of you have seen that and know that uh, um, that is absolutely beneficial to think like that. So determine in the beginning and you see what their role is. Is it a better fit for retail or wholesale, right? And then look, are you cutting costs? So I know sometimes I've had a couple of used car managers where the lot looks better than ever. But then I see, you know, we're averaging $85 per car on paint touch-ups and all these other things. 
you're not going to get that back most of the time. And it depends on the time that you want to do that. You have to look and look at your busy times, et cetera. Maybe when there's, there's that, uh, 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 you know, demand, that pent up demand, maybe you might not spend some of that money because you're going to sell those cars anyway. It doesn't mean don't make them look good. It just means take a look and see where you're spending some of that extra money. So that's unnecessary work. And then streamlining. I think you look at the recon process, you have to know um, and not guess how many days. Ask your used car manager, you know, how many days does it sit in each position? How many days does it sit behind service before it gets put into a bay? You know, your, your, your service department, I mean, they still have to look at you guys and, and say, uh, you know, the used car department's their best customer, right? Even though it might not be retail in a lot of situations, it still is the best customer. And when we talked about the 17% losing the value, you know, $10 a day doesn't sound like a lot, but it adds up. So closing this down, like I said, process versus recommended behavior. Last slide here. I'll leave this up so that you can look. One thing I've learned at CDK is I get a really good look, guys, at the top 20% of our dealers, 9,000 plus dealers um, in North America. And I see what the top 20% uh, benchmark is. So we always throw around benchmark, but with that many data points, guys, it's real. So I look at the top 20% and, and they actually are able to recon and have their vehicles ready on the lot in five days versus seven to 10 on the average dealer. That might not seem like a big difference. I had a really smart owner before I came an owner, became an owner show me that it really is a big difference. Like even when the internet first started, you know, popping and even, even how everybody has to be intelligent with at least getting the description up on the internet within an hour, right? Even if you don't have pictures yet or put up pictures that you take, you know, with the iPhone before you actually get the professional ones, you have to be ready. So last three things there, look at the bottlenecks. When you guys uh, get back uh, to work today, just think high level and say, don't get paralyzed with everything you have to do post COVID here. Still the, the auto business, but know that people are going to expect things a little bit different. Okay. So cater to that, but make sure that you also, when you get back, ask the employees that are involved. I learned a lot by asking great questions. Okay. And I learned to kind of zip my lip uh, over the years and listen to what people had to say. Think about and ask, I learned at Infinity. I asked a couple of my used car uh, porters. I asked them questions. I learned a ton about my business from talking to the used car porter. Ask, ask your used car manager if you have a technician that just works on your used cars. Ask those people what they think, what their thoughts are in the process, how it could be improved, <clears throat> uh, what tools are using, if they're happy with them. All of these things, because you're going to find that these people are key not just to making sure that your cars are ready, but also that you know uh, what you don't know. So having uh, said that, a couple of things here you probably looked at uh, as far as what even recon, we look at what a car depreciates every day, right? We said the, the $10, but take a look also at the recon. And if you look at the average recon and you look at this streamlining, if you can, if you can trim it down three or four days, guys, you're talking about $120 sometimes times the amount of cars, you know, that you have in your lot times months. So last thing I'll say, and I'm not sure how many people do it, but if you are wholesaling, if you are using the auction, whether you're buying or selling your cars, sometimes, and I've seen some really good dealers tell me, and I didn't do this a lot when I was, was on your side, um, but I see it a lot now talking to more dealers that they'll use the, um, the auction house is to actually do some of the recon work if you don't have uh, that recon service in-house. Sometimes you can actually save more money streamlining, get it done faster to save that extra time. So if you look at it and say, it cost me a hundred dollars to do it in-house, but it cost me 120 to do it there, but I can get it on the lot three days quicker or four days, make your own decision, but just keep that in the back of your mind, keep it in your pocket. So appreciate the time. Uh, thanks for letting me go over this. And if you have any questions, I guess, Rick, if, whether it's now or at the end, I'll, I'll defer back to you. Yeah, well, I do have a question, Ron. A couple of interesting points that you brought up. First of all, you said 
process and then recommended behavior. Process versus recommended behavior. So what do you define, uh, Ron, if I were to ask you, what's the difference? Yeah, it's th that's big. And I try to equate it all the time to the easiest metaphor or, or, or really just keeping it real simple. You can really dive into this and debate it, but it really is looking at yourself and what you do and say, okay, even think of yourself, you know, no matter what you do in the dealership, if I'm a salesperson and I need, and I know I need to talk to three people a day uh, to sell one car or whatever it is, I also have to take a step back and think about, you know, smart, the SMART questions, right? I have to think about not just, I need to talk to three people. I also have to think, well, how many phone conversations do I have? have to have to get those three people? How many appointments do I have to set, et cetera? So it all goes back to not just looking at the high level number or the high level process, but looking at what it takes to get you there. Because a lot of us, you know, over the years, we look at um, finishing off the month. It used to be you stayed open bell to bell the last day. Now everybody does it the last week. Why? Because we don't hit our numbers because we throw a number up there, but we're not thinking about the irons and the fire, the things to do that. That is what process is. It's doing those things every day that you have to do so that you can hit the goals and not just saying we need to sell 100 cars this month, but how are we going to get there? So it, it really is kind of the, the question you need to ask yourself. Are we doing this right? Yes. Okay. Ask yourself the next question. Is it happening daily or, or not even daily? Is it happening um, um, weekly, monthly, however you need to do it? Ask yourself the question. Yeah. The other um, point I think that uh, that you made is that every vehicle has to have an exit strategy, and um, when we when we ask ourselves, you know, I'll ask the dealers that are here, Garrett, Brandon, um, uh, uh, Golf, would you would you sign for a seventeen a seventeen percent loan? How about a fifteen percent loan or twelve percent loan? The answer, of course, is hell no. I wouldn't sign for a 12% loan, uh, uh, capital, uh, capital um, uh, loan. Um, but all of our used vehicle inventory is costing us 12, 15, 18, 17%. You say it's 17%. Um, and there's no line on the financial statement that says, this is how much it costs you to carry your used vehicle inventory and allow your used vehicle inventory to age. If it was, boy, maybe we would do it. Uh, we'd do it a, a whole lot different. But I think the key element that you spoke about is having an exit strategy um, and adopting a philosophy that not every vehicle has the same amount of shelf life. If you're a Chevrolet dealer um, and you take a Chevrolet on trade or you purchase it from the auction, it has a, a shelf life, right? Because we all have aging parameters. Um, um, and some of us might say, well, that's 75 days in my store, 90 days in my store, uh, shelf life, normal shelf life. But if I take, if I'm a Chevrolet dealer or a Nissan dealer and I take a, a Range Rover on trade and I intend to keep that car or a Lexus or a Cadillac and I intend to keep that car in inventory and that's not my core inventory, should my aging uh, strategy be the same? Should my shelf life be the same? Something maybe that Brian would talk to us about. Um, so uh, uh, I'll ask you, um, uh, Jason, editor. If you have a Lexus in your General Motors store, now, now uh, uh, um, Jason is a General Motors dealer, should that car have the sh same shelf life as a Chevrolet? No, absolutely not. Um, on that, when we look at that as an exit strategy, it'd probably be, first, we'd want to wholesale a Lexus in our area where we're at, but it's definitely something let's that say, Let's say you didn't wholesale the car, uh, Jason, because... It's a twenty-seven thousand dollar car, and Steve. So Steve, if it's in a wheelhouse as far as pricing, I guess. And you, you bought know, a car have, for twenty-seven eight, and you can't get twenty-seven eight, so you have to keep. It. So yeah, it should it have the same yeah. shelf life? And how do you look at it differently? It definitely can't have the same shelf life. It, I guess I'd look at the time of the year. Obviously, is going to play a factor in that in our economy, right? When we're in Saskatchewan, and a car like that, thirty days, it's got to be. It's got to be priced to move and be gone in 30 days. So 30 you're days. You're looking at, you know, now we're looking at stuff in June, July. And if you look at even a car in our area, 
you know, 90 days is taken into the fall where it's maybe not movable anymore already. So, yeah. so, so you'd say 30 days and what's your, what's your normal shelf life on a, on a Malibu? Is it 90 or 75 or? Again, do you want to use Malibu or a truck? I guess a car again. Let's use, no. let's use a Silverado. <laughs> uh, on a Silverado, our shelf life in our group is 75 days. So it's less than half is what you're, you're telling me. 100%. It has to be. It has to be. It has to be different. And, yep. and I think the key takeaway is, boy, you better have a core and non-core strategies. Exactly. It's my core product. And what do I have in inventory that's non-core?